Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 527. The one we were going to record on Monday is being recorded on Tuesday. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You're listening on the 27th of August, 2019. Welcome to the show, ladies, gentlemen, clergy, and laity alike. Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm get, getting a rhythm down on the intro. It's, it's kind of neat for such an unscripted program. I'm going to turn to my notes. We have responsibilities as viewers of Anglican Unscripted, and that's to keep the show alive in the communion. And you can do that by sharing this episode with your friends, family, clergy, laity alike, everybody in your parish. Uh, please comment on the YouTube channel. You'll see the uh, all the comments going on there. We get about 80 to 100 per episode, and we really appreciate that. We love the comments that really compliment us. We appreciate that. We love the comments that really bring uh, more further discussion to the issues we talk about. And we even love the ones that correct our mistakes. It happens. We know. Also, we want you to like the episode. Click that little thumbs up button on Facebook and YouTube when you see a episode. And for those of you who just don't have time to look at three guys on screen, but you still want to follow, you can listen to the podcast. In the show notes on the YouTube channel, you will see a link to the podcast, which you can sign up for. Okay, gentlemen, uh, how you been doing, George? Very good. Wonderful time here in beautiful Florida. Uh-huh. Gavin, does not look like you're in England. I guess we're not going to tell people where you are, but uh, no, no, bonjour. I'm, bonjour. I, I'm in France, and I'm, uh, I spend the morning uh, doing hard physical labor on a, on a very unyielding drive that um, nature is trying to take over in the afternoon, doing hard mental and spiritual labor on, a, on, on written work. Because, okay. Because, uh, uh, we're getting now. We always have some technical difficulties with internet speed and stuff like that. Today, Gavin dropped his microphone. I nobody's here is laughing. George and I have done it. I've dropped my microphone and I had to order a new one. George has one that's in pieces, but he still uses it. Uh, that's just the nature of being a host and co-host on Anglican Unscripted. You break things, and so we're going to try and fix uh, Gavin's audio in the in the post, and hopefully we can make him sound. Like he's been smoking nice, smooth vocals. He's a professional singer and all. You know that. George, I think the first story you're going to help me with here, there's going to be some new archbishops of the Anglican Communion. It happens more frequently than you would know. There's, you know, 39 or 40 of them. Uh, and I guess Uganda is having a new one and Nigeria. Bring us up to date. Well, there are 42 primates. Mm -hmm. uh, 39 of whom are a part of the Anglican Consultative Council, and then the Anglican Church of Brazil and the Anglican Church of North America, but all 41 or primates. Okay. Yeah. Tomorrow, the 28th of August, uh, there's a new election in Uganda. Stanley Antigali is stepping down. He's hit his 65th birthday. And in March, Nicholas Oko, the Archbishop of Nigeria, will be replaced. And recently we've had, uh, within the last year, Tanzania's had a new archbishop, South, uh, the Indian Ocean's had a new archbishop, and uh, does and Canada and other places have had new archbishops. Now, politically, this is a major transition point because the way GAFCON works is that it's archiepiscopally led. Um, West Africa and Tanzania were among the original GAFCON provinces. When Justice Akrofi and Valentin Mokiwa retired, the next archbishops elected took them out of Gafcon. Then, recently, a group of Tanzanian bishops rejoined Gafcon with the primates on the fence. And we'll probably see the next Archbishop of West Africa bring that back into Gafcon. Now, I don't see any problems with Uganda and Nigeria because their house of bishops are fairly tightly tied along the same lines as the archbishop is. But we're seeing a great deal of political back, backdoor maneuvering. Justin Welby takes his time a year and the fall to make trips around the world. He's going to Southeast Asia, he's going to Borneo, he's going to India. 
And while he's there, he's going to impress upon people the need to attend the Lambeth Conference, the need to be a good soldier and hold together. And oh, earlier this summer, Welby went to All Saints Cathedral in Nairobi and gave a sermon reaffirming his personal position on homosexuality and same-sex marriage and whatnot. And the Archbishop of Kenya, Jackson Oli Sapit, who's relatively new, said after this, after this meeting, we are not going to Lambeth. That was a change. He had been going to Lambeth as of a year ago. He's not now going to Lambeth because he's basically come to understand that Justin Welby's words do not always have the meaning that uh, he that uh, non-English speakers think they have. Mm. They don't trust Welby. So well, well, if he's trying to split people off from the various political movements. Now, at the same time, here's the interesting thing. People, uh, Anglican watchers assume it's always the conservatives are being problematic. A few years ago, when Catherine Jefferson Shorey was Archbishop Primate of the Episcopal Church, she, the, she raised the idea of an Episcopal communion of Canadians and, and the other Brazilians and the Scots and the Welsh. Oh, the little islands, yes. Those people, perhaps we should have our own communion. If GAFCON can have their team, why can't we have their team? And there's pushing in the Episcopal House of Bishops who say, have been saying, look, for 20 years, these people in London have been kicking us. We've even, and now our viewers may laugh, say, ha, 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 all the, you know, you've gotten away with murder. But still, if you think you're right and you're chastised, but no action takes is taken, you're still upset at being chastised. So what's resurfacing is this sense in the Episcopal and Canadian world, look, is that, look, we're paying the way for this communion. Our money is calling the shots, Trinity Wall Street and the Episcopal Church. And we have no voice other than for us to be good boys and take the punishment that's handed out to us. This has got to end. So Welby is, is in a difficult position of trying to balance liberals who are basically sick and tired of being kicked when they're asked to pay the way, and conservatives who don't, Nigerians, Ugandans, don't send any money to the ACC. They're, you know, they say, look, Welby and this whole project is uh, heterodox. And Welby is trying to resolve all this by sort of putting people in a deep sopophoric gloom that if we just hold on long enough, when we retire, the next man can figure, or woman can figure out what to do. I remember... Really Time. I remember early on, uh, there was a leak letter that said uh, the Church of England and the communion is willing to take a 10 to 15 percent hit. Yes, Colin Coward, uh, a friend of ours, though not an, a not a on the same team within the Anglican world as ours, uh, had a meeting with, uh, is it David Porter? Yes, uh, David Porter was the, the guy. Porter, yeah. Who was Archbishop of Canterbury's assistant for all this stuff. And it was reported that Welby was willing to lose 15% of the Anglican communion, meaning the conservatives, if he could hold the rest together. And so the Welby agenda internationally and globally and, in, and locally in England has been to talk, 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 take no action and allow attrition of the conservatives to strengthen his political stance. Well, Gavin, I don't see a 15% loss in the Church of England. I no, see I, a 2 I, to 5% loss, tops. Well, I, I think I'd also tell the story slightly differently from George. Not that George is wrong, but mm -hmm. I think the policy was much more focused and uh, aggressive in the way in which George has reported. Um, so for really quite a long time now, the progressive values of, a, of, of, of gender equality uh, and same-sex marriage have been at the heart of the people who have been making appointments in the Church of England. Indeed, Welby was appointed in order to carry these things out. So it isn't just, I think, as, as George was saying, it's not untrue, but it's not the main focus, that, that they are prepared to take a hit over Conservatives to keep the Anglican communion together. There is actually a pioneering determination to change the cultural face of Christianity in the West. And if the price of that is losing up to 10% of the traditionalists in the church, they'll pay that price. It's a price worth paying. The problem, so the, the, the policy is an aggressive one, and it's been pursued aggressively, certainly in terms of both appointments, uh, 
and the way in which at home the uh, George was saying that, that when Welby went to to, um, uh, to to Kenya, he said he personally wasn't in favour of gay marriage. But actually, his public pronouncements in Ho at home, in the Spectator and elsewhere, have all been profoundly sympathetic to it. So he has two faces: one for home consumption and one for African consumption. Now the fact is, that what about the ten percent, which is what Kevin was asking? Well, there's nothing like they, they, <laughs> there's nothing like ten percent loss. Um, they've lost some people to the ordinary acts, and they've lost some people to other churches. But essentially, everybody else is hunkering down and trying to avoid talking about it and hoping that if they don't have to do anything about it, they can just keep their heads below the radar. Well, um, I, I've seen clergy, I've seen laity, and even bishops. I uh, tell you one thing uh, in private and then do something completely different in public. I was very depressed the other day because one of the bishops that I had some hope for was Jonathan Goodall, who's the Bishop of Epsleet, one of the society bishops. And as mm -hmm. everybody knows, uh, many of the other society bishops uh, carry with them the assumption that, that they live within a gay subculture, even if they don't express it uh, in public. And Jonathan Goodall was the one bishop in the society who didn't. He's an immensely um, talented man. Uh, he's theologically clever. Uh, he he uh, has appeared to have a, a man of really high moral caliber. And my hope and the hope of a number of other traditionalists was that as there was some kind of shakedown within forward in faith, Jonathan Goodall, the Bishop of Epstein, would emerge to be a leader and would, would, would reassert um, the values of holiness in the Anglo-Catholic movement. So it was a great surprise when uh, he, he, as patron of one of the churches on the south coast are living where they've been a very holy priest and a, a very impressive pastoral work done over decades when he surprised the church wardens by by offering them uh, a, a splendid man who was a roman catholic priest who'd come over and spent a year at st stephen's house and who'd be bringing with him his civil partnership gay friend well if that's goodall's position the end is very nigh <laughs> I, uh, it, We've been doing Anglican Scripture for a while, and as far as I can see, and somebody can correct me, but Vladimir and Ridley's candle is blown out. You know, it, it's over. Somebody needs to strike a match and, strike, and light another candle because uh, the Church of England uh, and the shores of England are lost. Yes, uh, institutionally they may be, but I think... Um, I have some. I've always admired Bishop Goodall. I have to tell you, I'm when Gav, when Gavin talked about this earlier in our pre-show, he talked about Jonathan, and I kept thinking this is Jonathan Baker, the Bishop of Fulham, who's another forward and faith bishop, society bishop. And I wasn't, and I went, went ho hum. Uh, that that's a surprise and a shocker, but to hear it was Jonathan Goodall was a shock and a surprise. That having been said, the wardens in the vestry. The parish council at St. Uh, Peter's or Paul's or uh, wherever it is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I should give the name of the parish. Uh, sure. He's not been appointed so in. One of the churches is named St. Peter or St. Paul's, so you can guess which one it is in England. <laughs> why did the vet, why did the parish council go along? What they don't. This is not the Catholic Church where they're or the Methodist Church where they're just sent a minister. The lay people have a responsibility to stand and fight too, and we're so we're not only seeing in this in this example we're not only seeing institutional collapse we're seeing the collapse of the lady as well, because the lady I mean you, you go back to the time of uh, the third century it was the lay people that saved the church from the bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in the Episcopal Church. The ACNA and this whole movement I, was driven by lay people. I can't tell you how many uh, eight cardinal churches in the Episcopal Church that quit uh, the Episcopal Church to go into the Anglican Communion Network then went into the ACNA. When I talked to the clergy one-on-one, -on -one, it was, well, we really did this because the lay people wouldn't take it. They wouldn't stand for it. And it wasn't where the, the min it very rarely was it the minister who said, we're doing this. Because those churches that did that usually fell apart, but it was the lay people that built the ACNA. 
led by good and honorable, decent men and women in the clergy, Bob Duncan and so forth. But we can't put this all on Jonathan Goodall because we have to say that you know this is a you know this is a relationship, and the the lady buckled as well as the bishop buckled. If what we're hearing is true, well, it's interesting because in England, in the Church of England, you know that the clergy do not have your back. Time and time again, we re read in the press where a Christian is being persecuted, and at no time do I see any quotes from Christian uh, from Church of England priests or Church of England bishops saying. Um, what the state is doing is wrong, or what happened with the police and this Christian is wrong. I don't see any defense of Christians uh, from the state religion of, the, of England. I think there are times when a state religion can be a blessing and a strength. Uh -huh. uh, and and when, when the wind is with the gospel, the fact that a Christian church is at the heart of the body politic means that if you have holy people, people who are profoundly committed to Christ, the opportunity for using it as a platform to be salt and light to society, to call people to repentance and new life is a very profound one. But the converse is true. And at the moment, we live in a society which is increasingly anti-Christian. And the church has taken fright and lacked courage. I mean, I, I've been involved in a small st um, Twitter spat about the silly Helter Skelter in Norwich Cathedral. And some, some really otherwise perfectly honorable evangelical people have been saying, well, of course the cathedral has to give a welcome to all. These are people who didn't think the cathedral was their building. Well, at this point, I, I, I had trouble restraining myself. It's not their building. It's, it's <laughs> that there is this ridiculous idea that some of the churches there for everybody, a kind of universalism has crept in as part of the unthinking reflex of, of, of an Erastian settlement. Well, you know, you don't change the doctrines of salvation and heaven and hell and judgment just because the church is established and politically compromised. And yet, um, out of laziness or fear or something else, uh, there is this sense amongst so many people in the Church of England that they have just gone on with gone with the time. And I think there's poor, poor, poor laity in, in this church, <laughs> whose name I'm not going to give for the moment, um, on the south coast of England. John, um, George is right. Jonathan Goodall is a man who's immensely respected by those who know I'm really sorry that he's buckled on this one. I think it's a, I, I think it's, I think it's a terrible tragedy. I had hopes, and at this point, I express, I expose my naivety. Uh, I had hopes that there might be a residue of holy Anglo-Catholics within the society who would make compact with a group of of, of holy evangelicals, all of whom were looking for, uh, in a in a Newmanesque way for a purified church. Um, Gavin, that's Gavin, I enjoy just as much as the next man kicking and go Catholics. I really think it's a fun sport for an evangelical to do. We can make fun of them and all this and that. But you know, the evangelical world in England is no better. Um, people, so, people write to me and ask, well, what is happening with the Fletcher story in the Ewarden circle and all this and that? And I respond, it's dead. Yeah. It's dead because there's a Fletcher firewall that's been built. Uh, the people I've been talking to are now saying, well, now that Ixa is going to look at Jonathan Smythe, we don't have to get involved. And so now all the evangelical sins are going to be placed on a dead man, and we don't need to worry about Jonathan Fletcher and the circle of cover up that is, took place. In fact, there's a, an EFAC conference in the United States, and I'm looking at the speakers list. Some of these speakers are involved in the cover up themselves. And yet they're still being trotted over to the United States as being paragons of how to do the evangelical way when these people shouldn't even be priests because they have abused their trust and violated uh, their trust as clergy. Hey, but it doesn't matter because oh. they're on our team. Uh, they're not Anglo-Catholics. They're one of us. Well, sure, they covered up for their friends. Sure, they got jobs. Sure, they did this and that. But it's all Jonathan Smythe's fault, and he's dead. Uh, the evangelical, and I'm an evangelical, Gavin, will tell you I'm not an Anglo-Catholic. And the evangelical world is no better than the Despite my best efforts, George. <laughs> <laughs> Despite my best efforts, you're still an evangelical. Funny, yeah. Oh, look what I'm worried today. So I you guys know. should see the, the before show talks we have sometimes about uh, um, theology. <laughs> I'm profoundly evangelical as an adjective. 
but 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 for me, it, the, the, it's a gospel adjective rather than a tribe. But George's point is is right. You know, let let's take a, a global metaphysical view. We are we are all subject to, to to assaults by the enemy to water down, to pervert, to terrify, to compromise us. And as we said time and time again, the only antidote to that is penitence. And it, and it's I've been shocked. You know, there they are, George, saying quite rightly these people have behaved very badly in terms of the cover-up. I've been shocked as I've listened to some of the people who've been threatened by them. Mm. I, I've, been, I've been very, very upset that that men I respected in the evangelical world have behaved in a, in a thoroughly pugnacious and threatening way to people who are already wounded, uh, honourable, tough, but wounded, and look for diff something different. And I'm, and I'm deeply upset that Jonathan Goodall should have given into the zeitgeist on this matter. We, we, we definitely need people to stand up for principles. But I would, I would argue, I agree with you, Evan. I would take this further and say the same thin sin of which we're berating Justin Welby, placing the institution above the truth, is what Goodall appears to have done in uh, his parish placement, and which evangelical, a certain group of evangelicals are doing in the Fletcher firewall. We're not going to allow our good name and our heritage to be uh, besmirched, even though this man did these terrible things. Uh, we're not going to uh, admit it or do the right thing. And you've, you, we're now in the position where the scripture union, of all things, is refusing to cooperate. The UN Trust is refusing to cooperate to the truth that gets out. How can these organizations solicit money from Christians I think you meant the Titus Trust. You said Titus the Scripture Trust. Union, but as I understand it, it's the Titus Trust. The Titus Trust and the Scripture Union. How can these people, with a straight face, solicit funds from other Christians when they are engaging in behavior that may be legally prudent, but is abhorrent to Christian decency? This might be a good time for a transition. That's what I'm here for. I provide transitions. Are they incident or no? We're no, 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 <laughs> no. Uh -uh. I, I, this show would uh, off the rails. It'd be a 25 minute dissertation of how to go off the rails. We would need a firewall next week for ourselves, the unscripted firewall. I do want to talk about Archbishop of uh, Cantic, no, Archbishop Virtue Signal or, well, whatever. This week is Greenbelt. And uh, Gavin commented on a, a, a twitted picture uh, out there this week. And I, I kind of want to talk about that because in a way, the picture encapsulated in a whole what is currently going on uh, over in evangelical England. And uh, George, give us a quick one round of run drown, <laughs> run down of what Greenbelt is. And then Gavin, talk a little bit about your picture. Well, for me, I think I need to, you, uh, I have read, I need to roll my eyes, okay. sigh, and say, oh my, and that's all you need to know about Greenbelt. Yes. Can we, can we, can we do it the other way around? Can George, cause, because George knows the reputation of the lady. Oh, sure, cool. uh, I'm, you are, I'm just here to talk. You guys do what you want. No, 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 go ahead. George, if I, if I just set a very brief context of Greenbelt, and then you explain the content of, of the picture, and I'll say why I took it. Um, so Greenbelt is, is a Christian arts festival that's been going since 19, maybe 1970, certainly yeah, 1980s. Probably, yeah. During the whole of the 80s, I used to take the kind of cool people in my parish to it, and it was it was it was a wonderful arts festival, uh, and um, it was 90% Christian with with 10% you know artistic stuff hanging on, as I, that was, and no one cared about the boundaries. The, the blurred blind, the blurred boundaries were fine. Um, but one of the, it was during, it was at Greenbelt that I learned my homophilia, because every single year there would be platforms of people saying, actually, gay is fine, and because gay people are quite as capable of loving, stable, faithful, generative, kind, affectionate relationships, these are the marks of the Holy Spirit. This is a movement of the Holy Spirit, and you did, you need to stop being horrid and and read less of St. Paul. And the thing is, after a while, it'll really, if, if you hear this in a really cool place often enough from people you respect, you begin to say, well, I quite like this. And, and, and the nice thing about it is it allows you to adopt public attitudes that other people also think are immensely virtuous. And that was where I began my journey into LGBT activism. 
the, the problem with Greenbelt now is it has slowly, the blurred boundary has moved so that it's about 5% Christian and 95% other. And it's <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? Yeah. 95% is pretty gruesome. Um, and, 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 and also the difference is in those days, you didn't get, you very seldom got bishops turning up because it was, it was kind of on the sort of, it was seen as, as not being wholly established. The reason I took this picture was it, there was a picture placed by the Bishop of London. I so want to be rude about her name, but God forgive me and help me. Um, there we are, um, Sarah Mullally, Dame Sarah Mullally. Uh, have it straight. And she said, I'm so glad to be amongst old friends. And there was the Archbishop of Canterbury looking characteristically grim. A few people who looked like they were bodyguards and looked even grimmer. And, 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 and a clergywoman who had a heavily, heavily tattooed torso and an exaggerated dog collar and also looked very grim. And as I looked at this picture, um, it wasn't that it contained a, 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 a woman clergyman who had tattoos. They weren't very pleasant, but, you know, so what? All that it was taken by the Bishop of London. The picture oozed decadence. I, I can't explain why. I looked at it and, and my stomach turned and I went, this is revolting. Uh, how is it possible that the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of London are, are meeting in a social setting of a heterodox confident conference, arts festival, that's 90% non-Christian, celebrating this as a comfortable place and, 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 and get that smell? George, you might like to talk about the people in the photograph. <laughs> well, the... Uh... Archbishop of Canterbury is... Okay, well, I, I'm going to put the photograph on screen right now, so they're looking at it. I believe that is Mark Oakley, uh, whom the Archbishop of Canterbury is in the huddle with, and Mark Oakley just was awarded the Michael Ramsey Prize for Theology, best book on theology. And uh, Sarah Mullally and Archbishop Welby are among the judges. And this is an aside, not on Gavin's point, but in 2010, Tom N.T., Bishop N.T. Wright's book on, I think, Paul won the mm. prize on theology. Good book. And this year, Welby and Mulally awarded it to a book of poetry. It tells you <laughs> the intellectual heft of the current crop of leaders. But, and seated in a chair is an American Lutheran pastrix as she calls herself, Nadia uh, Bowles-Weber. Nadia Bowles-Weber is uh, a rock star on the progressive Christian circuit. She's a Lutheran pastor, and she's one of these people. She's about our age, in her 50s. She's one of these people who has made a career of, like Jack Spong, of being an ex-evangelical, ex-fundamentalist. And she is... She started a church in Denver called the House of All Saints and Sinners and is noted for using four-letter words and expletives and having very aggressive uh, tattoos and always wearing sleeveless shirts so that one sees these aggressive tattoos. And, and her theological, she believes the, the Apostle Paul got it wrong, that the adonement is child, divine child abuse. She believes that Wicca, the goddess worship, is an aspect of the Trinity and the divine. Uh, she's pro. She's an extreme abortion activist. She's done transgender naming services and gay weddings, and all, so and so and so forth. She's lionized uh, by some on the left as the face of the new Christianity because she created a church of 190 people in Denver who just love this progressive, edgy, sort of foul mouth Christianity. And so she's brought out to these things, and she is a really charismatic person. She's a great entertainer. Mm -hmm. uh, now, she's since moved on from her Denver's parish, and now that she's not there, that sort of edgy Christianity has completely collapsed. But here's the Bishop of London, former nurse, who's not very well-traveled, who's not very well-connected in the greater religious scheme of things, holding up her dear friend, Nadia Bowles Weber, who she probably met earlier that day, as being a paragon of where the church needs to go. Now for Gavin, his response was the utter decadence of this photograph, which spoke to promoting, I'll use, these are my words, not Gavin's, but promoting a satanic ideology, promoting a, the demonic. For me, it was the utter vapidity 
of the Bishop of London and the utter uh, political plasticity of the Archbishop of Canterbury dressing down with uh, jeans and a uh, and a priest shirt to, with the call. I just want to go to Justin Welby and go push that in. <laughs> And uh, and little LL Bean, they weren't LL Bean moccasins, but you know the type, the, the, the sort of the sort of dress that your your father would like to uh, to wear on his Saturdays off when he would be pretending to putter around the garage with a clergy collar. The imagery, the symbolism of a decadent, vapid church that has lost its way, that is not connected to. Nadia Bowles Weber, good for her. If she wants to preach what she wants to preach, that's fine. She's the Lutheran's problem. But to hold her up as the way the church is going to go in the future either speaks to a complete ignorance, which I'm tempted to believe on the part of the Bishop of London, or submission to the demonic forces at work that seek to destroy the church. Well, we can rest assured they were not I'm part not of the get five. A Christmas card from London. No, you're not. It, but the picture does not represent the five percent of the Christian of Greenbelt. It represents the ninety-five percent that we we spoke about. You know, uh, the artsy craftsy uh, part. It was interesting, and I, you know, I we need to keep the the shores of England in our prayer that there can be another flame lit. Uh, you know. See, what I find fascinating is, is that there's no secret in church growth. There's a lot of academic research. There's a lot of practical research and experience. There are churches in the United States and even in... Okay, George, we lost you. It's the French phrase. <laughs> just like, okay, George, repeat yourself. We just lost you for a second. You just lost me. Well, the uh, we went across academic research, and then, yes. and then you were overwhelmed by the, by, by the weight of what you were about to impart. <laughs> there are successful parishes in the United States and in England, and I was holding up a friend of the show, Melvin Tinker, who has a parish in Hull. Hull is not a destination spot. You don't visit Hull along with Stratford and Avon and Stonehenge and, and London when you visit England. Hull is in the north on the east coast. Yet Melvin Tinker has been able to build a parish by preaching the gospel, doing old-fashioned pastoral work that has young people, has children, has life and vigor and enthusiasm, and doesn't bother with any of the, you know, oh my goodness, this woman has created a church of 190 people in secular Denver. Oh my goodness, Melvin Tinker at the same time has created a church of 600 people in secular hall who are, you know, when they promote these sort of shortcut, fast hip, uh, fast tracked hip way of being church, they forget that there's a no secrets here. God will not be mocked. And where he's honored, his, this, it, the church flourishes. I think most noticeable the, uh, of the picture we're talking about is that these are people who are not going to be known by their fruits. You know, that's that's the bottom line. I have had an enjoyable time on the show. Episode 527, kind of fun. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm the always slanderous George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and since Kevin's giving you the episode number, I'll remind you of the date. 27th of August, 2019. Thank you.